before presidential elections. I see another young man in the name of Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta. And I ask why not? And the name Uhuru Kenyatta has featured prominently. That's what happened to Uhuru in 2008. People recognized him as now, not so much the son of Jomo, but is Uhuru the man. Participated in three years. I hereby declare Mr. Uhuru Mugai Kenyatta. One, two. Lost one. In fact, people are happy for Kibake to win and then uh, Nacha Uhuru for the future. Karibu. Karibu and skipped one. He made a very bold decision. And it was the right decision. Also shows you he has been very consistent in leading his people and also appreciating the interest of his people. Our nation has now successfully navigated the most complex general election in our history. Tonight on the Kenyan Historian, Prince to King. I, Uhuru Kenyatta, I assume as President of the Republic of Kenya, in full realization of the high calling, I assume as President of the Republic of Kenya, In 2016, while covering President Kenyatta's visit of the Kingdom of Belgium, <laughs> journalists were asking about a variety of questions. But I was more interested in his past, especially his relationship with Kenya's second president, Daniel Arap Moy. President Moy is retiring. Yes. And then he says he's going for a young time. Yes. To lead the country. Yes. Did you have any imagination that you are the person the president was looking at? I'll tell that story once, but I won't tell it today. I, I, but I will tell that story at the appropriate time. All the best to you. All right. Everybody. And so seven years after he promised to tell the story, I tracked down a man who knew him before his political stardom. Former Gatanga MP, Devd Murade. We started in high school. He was in St. Mary's and I was in Nairobi school. And we would engage in terms of uh, sports. We'd love to defeat them in rugby. It was always very vicious. And then we left school. I went to the University of Nairobi. He went to Amherst. He tells me about Uhuru's love for rugby. He was both. He was a player and then the teams, whenever they we played them in their place, we would all go to cheer our side. Whenever they were playing, remember they were just across the street. St. Mary's is on St. Austin's. We are on Wayakiwe in Nairobi school. And in between, Loreto Convent Musongari, the girls, and we were fighting over the girls. But Uhuru Kenyatta was no ordinary student or rugby player and supporter. He was the son of Kenya's first president. Born in 1961, shortly after his father, Jomo Kenyatta was released from nearly a decade in British jails from Prince Philip on behalf of the Queen of England. And before becoming Kenya's first president in 1964, an elated Mzee Jomo Kenyatta named him Uhuru. The Swahili equivalent for freedom. His mother was Ngina, famously called Mama Ngina. 
an African prince, he was born. His father was after all the leader of African nationalism in Kenya. Some of them have misunderstood us. And the post-independence presidency was his to throw away. It is not my wish that I should be speaking to you in a foreign and for that matter in colonialistic language. The other children you are talking about were kind of old. Uh, the first one who had been born in the 1920s uh, and uh, had gone through some times. So had his sister. So the released Kenyatta, the one who came from jail, vigorous and so forth, so a lot of attention were paid to his children, the new children, not the old ones, the new children. And of the new children, who was the first? At this time, Kenya's independence was not a matter of if, but when. But here I am, ladies and gentlemen. I am just a human being like yourself. Uhuru became Mzee's darling. He was raised and treated as a prince ordained for the throne. And when Kenya became a republic and at a young age, he accompanied his father to state functions and cabinet meetings. The elders had extra respect, uh, attention to him because of his father. And uh, maybe some of the problems he had was trying to fit in, to separate himself from the father and be a, a young man, be a boy. And then other people trying to figure out how to deal with him so as not to annoy the father. One thing that he always was, was a pillar of strength. He always felt that so long as he was there, nothing could ever go wrong. Right? There was always somebody, or there was always a shoulder to lean on. It took time for us to actually realize that he wasn't there anymore. His parents ensured he mastered his native Kikuyu language. And the Swahili language that was spoken widely in Kenya. He was raised for operable purposes in Gatundo. Eh? And in Gatundo, what, what do you have there? The neighborhood, who are these people? See, they speak Kikuyu. Now, the area of privilege that one might think about is when he went to the schools. Eh? Because the schools he attended were not regular schools, we say that. They were the, the elite schools eh? for the elite children. So he associated with other elite children, and some of them became his long-life friends. Eh? But it was his closeness with Daniel Arap Moy, Kenya's vice president from 1967, and his father's principal assistant that will shape his political future decades later. See, Moi was like a father figure to Uhuru. Remember, Kenyatta died in 1978 when Uhuru was barely 16. Remember, Uhuru was born in 
So the person under whose patronage Uhuru grew up was Nyayo. When Jomo Kenyatta was very busy with the matters of state, Moi would actually go on behalf of Kenyatta like the parents' days. <laughs> or school prize giving days. He would go when uh, handling his own children, Gideon, Philip. He would also stand in for Jomo Kenyatta. There's a story where that uh, when the real uh, traditional power, kitchen cabinet of Jomo were meeting Nugeshuru, Bioko Inange, Joroge Mungai, that group. You know in Kikuyu they say the Ngato Arie. And Nyayo would be playing drafts with the little boys, Kina Uhuru, when those guys are doing their thing. So there was that connection between Uhuru and Nyayo. As the son of Kenya's founding father, Uhuru Kenyatta always had the name, the wealth, and the burden that comes with his heritage. Uru was your normal guy on the street. You'd go partying, you'd go to the nightclubs, you'd go, you know, on the picnics, trips, nyamachoma. He was not like the son of a president. He was your ordinary guy in the street. Very, very down to earth. Nobody ever thought he had uh, or he harbored any political ambition. The young Kenyatta always shied away from politics, wanting to be seen as an ordinary person at ease with ordinary Kenyans. In 1989, we all started getting married. He was among the people who were part of my uh, wedding. In fact, my, his car is the one that went for my wife in their village to bring her to Safari Park for us to go to the church. And then in 1990, he also got married. And we also participated in his marriage. <laughs> It was during this period that the fight for multi-party democracy was at its peak. Kenya was a one-party state. Political intolerance had defined Daniel Moy's rule. It was a very difficult time. Of course, there were those arrests. Uh, if I give my personal uh, experience, I was arrested so many times, had so many cases. I don't know which part of the country uh, I had not been taken to court or taken into a prison or a police station. Uh, so it was constant. Dissent was met with a heavy hand of the Kanu regime. Detention without trial was business as usual. People may not remember this, but him and uh, Mboya and uh, Aguins, uh, Caesar Kothek, people like Alfred Gitonga, the way that they issued a statement, remember that uh, Saitoti committee that went around and uh, generated a report that said Kenyans don't want multi-party. When people like Uhuru, the sons of the rich, the sons of the powerful, who were supposed to be establishment, when they came out and uh, said, yes, the country needs multi-partyism, that, I think, jolted uh, Nyayo. Before 1997, Uhuru Kenyatta was only known 
in the business world. A lot of people don't understand something. Mohuru is actually not the politician. His brother Mohoho Kenyatta is the politician. But people think Mohoho is a businessman and that Uhuru is the politician. But any business decisions, family and their decisions as a business, Uhuru is the chairman and he's the one who takes uh, those decisions. And the converse is also true. Any political decisions, uh, Mohoho Kenyatta, the one they call MK, is the chairman. It is rumored that he supported Mwai Kibaki's campaign for the top seat in 1992. The former vice president had resigned from his position as minister for health after the reintroduction of the multi-party politics in Kenya, which he initially opposed. His entrance into opposition politics destabilized the Forum for Restoration of Democracy Food, as CIA Senator James Orengo states. The uh, special branch was now why, uh, well aware uh, of, of the uh, discussions and the divisions that were emerging from Ford. So quite a number of them traveled to, uh, to the United Kingdom and told Matiba that, you know, this is your chance uh, and, and, and secondly you know they told him that you know if he did not take his chance then, then Mwai Kibaki was going to, to eclipse him uh, uh, and uh, Matiba was taken in uh, but not absolutely until the day when he came back and was received uh, in a way that I don't think a leader has been received in Kenya until uh, the time when Raila also was received. And then when he came, he had a very good reception at the airport, our president. Now, when he saw that reception, every politician, by the way, is moved by the ground. The one who came waving. And then they come waving. They, they were blackguards, yeah. waving him to be the president. The first thing he did when he now landed in Ford was a big quarrel with Jaramogi Odinga. And that trap caused, caused a split in Ford. Daniel Arap Moy will win the race against a divided opposition. But the then self-proclaimed professor of Kenyan politics started looking at the future of Kano 10 years from 1992. I'm asking you to vote for me. The repealing of Section 2A of Constitution had also brought in a new phenomena. Presidential term limit. So Moy was legally barred from contesting for the top seat in 2002. And so he started scheming how the leadership of Kanu and Kenya would be like without him at the helm. Even overseas think that Moy would like to cling to power. And few saw it coming. The son of his predecessor, Uhuru Mwegai Kenyatta, was at the center of his plans. Ahead of the 1997 general election through party elections, he made Uhuru the chairman of Kanu, Gatundu branch, and will ask him to contest for the area parliamentary seat, which was once held by his father. 
we knew he can't win on our canoe tickets. I remember we spent an evening in the Aishaweri home. Me and a friend of ours called Peter Gomba, son of the former mayor of Nairobi. And he explained to us, because we told him, no matter what you do, under canoe, under the circumstances, you won't get elected. But he explained to us why he cannot go against Moi. He will suffer the first setback of his political career. He was outvoted by Moses Muhia. So you could see there was um, a system, a grooming system for Uhuru to become something. And among all the young men of his age, those they had grown together and all those things, I mean, they, they, he kind of stood out because, um, not only because of his father, but also because Moi wanted him. In 1997, Moi had insisted that whoever was going to be elected on a canoe ticket from central Kenya would succeed him in 2002 as president. So he was going to name him the vice president. They all ran. They all failed. Uru failed. Kamado, Idunguri, Kariukiwa, Gata, all, you know, they all failed, including I defeated SK Macharia in 1997. He was running on Kanu. Remember, Moi took 14 months after that election to name a vice president. And uh, when he then gave it to Saitoti back, it was very derogatory. Sawa, nitawapatia nione kama itawaongezea masufuria ya ugali. You remember? Yes. So yes, it's true, they tried to get Uhuru. Uhuru refused. Moy won the presidency, and it was his final term at State House. And so, he put in motion a crash succession program. First of all, he declared his desire to hand over the baton to someone young and energetic. And so young politicians started jostling for his attention. We can only, it can only be fair if the 21st century is given to the dot-com generation. Wana inchi wetu, wana endelea kufilisika kwa sababu viongozi wenyewe waendelea kujitaftia yao. Na ikio wata endelea, tuasema basi vijana wako tiari kuungana, kufanya kazi pamoja, diyo tuweze kusaidia wana inchi wataifa hile tula Kenya. Tunaangalia macho yake vizuri sana, tunataka tumie saini yoyote kuonyesha ni direction gani, and we will be in full combat together. Elders, katika bunge, kila mmoja wao wakiwa mwanasiasa anasema, mimi niko na vijana. They are proud of the youth. Mimi niko na vijana. I think it is time, ata sisi, kama vijana, tuseme, sisi tuko na waze. Moi was saying he still wants Uhuru to play an active role in politics, and we were Uhuru. We insisted, yes, uh, show us good faith. And that is when he made him a chair of an interministerial committee. It was a disaster. Then they made him chair of uh, tourism, tourism board. The Kenyan economy was collapsing. Middle class Kenyans were angry. The PC is not elected by anybody. Whatever is here, it's you see, is, by one whatever you see here is illegal. Yes. It has been declared by the Provincial Security Committee as illegal. And Moy knew 
his government and Kano needed freshness. I would possibly agree that it, uh, it is not my initiative because as a been a team player and I have always been ready to uh, work with anybody who has the interests both of our party and of the country at heart and uh, from that perspective I think I was prepared to play as I've said many many times in the past any role that I would be offered either by my party or by Kenya. He pushes Makto to vacate his position as nominated MP. On this particular day in 2001, Raila Odinga and Musalim Davadi welcomes 41 year old Uhuru Kenyatta into parliament as nominated MP, taking over from Makto. Uhuru, Raila, and Musalia, what? the common uh, denominator among them. They are all children of the elite. Uh, Musalia, the son of who? Uh, Moses Mudamba, Substone, a uh, powerful minister for local government, and a very close of Daniel Aramoy, very close friend, because it said that it was um, Moses Mudamba who actually promoted Moy to become a member of the Legical, or helped him uh, when he was education minister. You look at uh, Raila, who is he? Son of Jaramogi Oginga Odinga, another prominent. So you have the children, the children of prominent personalities, then in parliament, receiving the child of another prominent person. He caught Raila Odinga who leaves the opposition benches to join government. He makes him minister and gives him the powerful secretary general position of the new Kano. By this time, Moy is still keeping his long-term plans for Kenyatta close to his chest. He's made minister for local government and later, one of the four vice chairman of Kano Slowly but steadily, Moy was pushing aside his longtime loyalists like Professor George Saitoti, creating room for Uhuru Kenyatta to ride to the top of the party hierarchy. There come a time when the nation is more important than an individual. It is because of that consideration and in consultation, that I say I shall not offer myself for any, as a guy for any position. A fascinated media industry shadowed moves made by those seen as possible successors to the outgoing president. <music> Professor George Saitoti, Moi's longtime vice president, Raila Odinga, the party's new secretary general and the man Moy recruited to revamp the independence party. Musariam Davadi, Katana Ngala, and Kalonzo Msioka. Fika haba kutulaki, mitasema mingi, waka baadae baadae kuangalia mambo mgada. One day, as Moy returned from overseas, he suggested that none of them was close enough. Then one evening, and during his visit of Mount Elgon region, he declared that Uhuru Kenyatta was indeed the chosen one. Man was very unpopular at the time. By August of 2002, it was clear to many people that the NAK, the alliance between Kibaki, Wamalwa, and Gilu, NAP, was winning. 
they are clearly they are winning. And the question is, the side, the other side, the country side was losing. Well, initially I thought that it is possible for Moi to sell a project. I was quite naive as well. And uh, I thought that if Moi says it, it'll happen. That's what I thought. I must tell you frankly. And you know it was a difficult decision for me. You know I come from Nyeri. And his opponent was Moi Kibaki from my home county. My own brother, the late Derito Kashagwa, the first governor of Yeri and an MP of Madeira, was a candidate under Mwai Kibaki. And we had sort of a family conflict because we are opposing, we are having different sides. But I was so convinced that whatever Moi wanted will happen. And since I wanted to be in government and I had been given a very senior position, I was quite happy. But along the way, what I know today, even Uru knows. Never thought there is any combination that can defeat Kanu at that time. You see, Moi was such a colossus. He was. We, we didn't believe Moi can lose uh, an election. His endorsement of Uhuru as his preferred presidential candidate would create a crisis in Kanu. Itakuwa ni kitendo cha usalata mkubwa kwetu kama viongozi kwenda kasarani kule tukiwa kama tunajua matokeo ya kasarani tayari yanajulikana disagreements fallouts that was the mood as it emerged and then the ones indomitable party that ruled Kenya since independence collapsed and he annoyed a lot of people who thought that they should be the one. Eh? Uh, Raila Odinga, who had uh, merged with Khan in the expectation that he might be the one. Saitoti, who was told that although he's a friend, he's, he's, he doesn't qualify. <laughs> Kalonzo Musioka, who keeps on saying that uh, he should have been the one. You know, uh, Simeon Yachai, who led the rebellion against Khan on these things. So there are all these people who expected Moi to get out so that they can get in. By the time Raila made a decision to boot out, it was too late. We had gone too far. And uh, even that time, Raila had gone for discussion. And Moi could hear none of it. The fact that, uh, you know, he was asking Moi, why don't you let us go to a delegates conference and come up with a presidential card? Don't force one on us. Because Raila was Secretary General of the party. And uh, Moi said, no, I've already decided. Just the way Uru has decided. You know, he was very stubborn and uh, thought that uh, he held the sway and whatever he said, Kenyans must do. And he believed this system nonsense about the district commissioners, about the chiefs, about the police. You know, Moi was saying, tu kona polisi, tu kona madisi, tu kona kila kitu, tu kona pesa, you know? And uh, we were saying this thing is not working. Moi kidogo. Time had come for Kanu to relinquish power. Uhuru is fresh. He has a global perspective, which is today's way of doing things. And in fact, we were doing very well until Raila came and said, Kibaki Tosha. And then we knew our goose was cooked. But up to that build up, Uhuru was doing very, very well as a Kanu candidate. 2002. So it is uh, something that was thrust uh, upon him by circumstances, but he was up to it. He was up to the task and he was willing to do it. Continuing where the son of Jomo Kenyatta was literally seen as sustaining the Kano Mafia state where Moi will still dictate the running of things in the house on the hill. The splinter group led by Raila Odinga, Professor George Saitoti and Kalonzo Msioka walked straight into the waiting arms of opposition leaders Charity Ngilu, Omalu Akijana and Mwai Kibaki. When I've looked around and talked to people with whom we have finally agreed on how to proceed, and with whom we have begun putting together the manifesto we shall present to Kenyans. 
I am convinced that we have a team which is going to be very, very strong. A juggernaut, the National Rainbow Coalition was formed. Uhuru, Moi's preferred successor, will be overwhelmed. There are some areas that we have definitely not gone the right path or not followed the right path. And I would like to see us be able to say, okay, let's now draw a line. This is where we start from. Let's learn from the mistakes that we've made in the past. And let's use that learning experience to be able to help us and to move us forward into the future. How will he have countered an infectious knock wave that was sweeping the country? And we believed in Kibaki. We believed in the team. We believed in Kijana Omalwa. And, and we saw hope. So, and, that, and that's how we came in. For Uhuru at that time, and Ruto, and Msalia, you see, we looked at them very differently. We looked at them as these are the young tax of Moi. All the challenges we are facing, been, they are part of that problem. They are young, they are supposed to be advising Moi, but they've taken advantage of Moi, and all they want is to see their things move. You know, in fact, let me tell you, people thought Moi had a plan B. You know, we were in the state house when the results were coming through, and some people were asking, is Moi aware of these results? What is he saying? When is he activating plan? Plan B. There was no plan B. It's not possible. The presidential election only confirmed what was inevitable. A resounding win for Mwai Kibaki and the NAC coalition. It will be Uhuru's major political defeat to date. Mwai Kibaki na hapa kwamba nitatenda kazi zangu za urais wa Jamhuri ya Kenya kwa uaminifu December 31st 2002 Mwai Kibaki takes the oath of office as Kenya's third president I felt disappointed, as of course anybody would feel, that I had lost. But I also felt it was my responsibility to accept that I had lost, and I did. I think one of the things he built for himself was a value of respect, a value of appreciating I can win, but also it's a, it's a, it's, it's a competition I can lose. And it also gave him another um, platform to now build himself. For the son of Kenya's first president, it's time to get back on the horse, taking the loss on his stride, and try to learn all he could from the experience. That is what he told me during our interview in 2016. He was ready for the next step. And after that, went back to regroup to start my life again because my life does not mean the beginning and the end of Kenya, no. Kenya comes first, Kenya is greater than anybody else. My name is Anoxikoli, and this is The Kenyan Historian.